listening to Omnitox Retail Fast Five, brought to you in partnership with the AM Consumer and Retail Group, Avalara, Williot, TGW, and Sezzle. Ranked in the top 10% of all podcasts globally and currently ranked number one in all of retail by Feedspot. The Retail Fast Five is the podcast that we hope makes you feel a little smarter, but most importantly, a little happier each week, too. Today is February 28th, 2024. I'm your host, Ann Mazinga. And I'm Chris. Well, I'm back for the third time. This is our third time, Ann, trying to do this podcast today, right? It is the third time recording this podcast today, despite many technical difficulties. We're here once again to discuss the most important headlines from the past week that highlight how the physical, digital, and human elements of retail are coming together to shape the future. Chris, we are um, we are in beautiful Palm Springs, which I guess if you're going to have three rounds of recording a podcast, being in Palm Springs while you do it is probably the best, right? I mean, you're right, Ed. I- I mean, yeah, to tell the audience, like we started off on the show floor, technical difficulties. We then went outside in front of a big till side, recorded a whole show, technical difficulties. Now we're back in the hotel room. And I was trying to think of, okay, like how do we hold it together here? And like, what can we do? How can we get inspired for this podcast? And, and I was thinking about it, like, you know, Etel is 25 years old, right? I mean, we talked about it yes. a little bit yesterday in our live stream, 25 years old. So that means it started in 1999. And it got me thinking like, what is the content that was happening in that show in 1999. It was probably things like, oh. how do you build a website, right? Right, or, you know, a great like, question. How do you put an image on your website, right? And so I think it's funny because as we think about, you know, generative AI in particular, yeah, that kind of feels like where we are again because it, we were talking to somebody this morning, we're like, he's doing a session on AI. Like, What's your session about? He's like, where could you use AI, right? Oh my like, God, what is yeah. AI? What is generative AI versus non-generative AI? Like, that's where we are again. And so I, I think we're in that next 30 year cycle of innovation. And, and for me, that's really inspiring to think about when we put that lens on it. Like we're all just at the rudimentary stage of learning together right. at shows like this. Right. And that's what we have to keep in mind. Yeah, for sure. No, I love it. I mean, I, where I thought you were like, ETL can drive a rental car now, but no, it's much more brilliant. You are going into things that really do get you thinking, which is so cool. They've done a really good job at this conference. Um, really excited to be here. And I think I'm, I, I, now I'm going to look at the rest of the sessions today with a totally new lens. It's really smart, Chris. I like it. I like where your head. Yeah. Going. It shifts your perspective on how you think about the whole topic. It does. You put it in, the, in the historical context of where are we now kind of, kind of idea too. Not, and, not great to it, think about that was 30 years ago for us. Like, I don't feel like that could be 30 years ago, but I, I'll deal with my aging in another way. Yeah. But another time. you know, the, the other thing too, that you were talking about this morning that I thought was really good too, is like, you were talking about how, like, you know, there is this element of, it evolving the digital retail experience as well by yeah. instilling more confidence in our purchases through the, the large language models that, you know, that it's able to um, process and provide information to consumers as they're shopping. So I, yeah. I think there's just a lot here, you know? Well, um, before we get into the show, Chris, I do want to tell our listeners just about a couple of things that they should be paying attention to. One we just launched a bunch of interviews from Etail. So everybody from Target to AutoZone to Sam's Club, like there are just a ton of interviews. They're all up on the podcast channel. So check them out. Sir La Tab. Oh, Sir La Tab. You're going to get to use your French a little bit in this episode, Chris. So I know. It's so great. Listeners, beware. Um, so we have those. We just dropped Snip Media's president, Tom Burgess, who joined yes. us to talk about banking loyalty apps. We talked about it last week in the podcast about Starbucks and Bank of America. You are going to want to pay attention to this one. Whole new approach to CPG advertising and retail media. Second or third, third. I'm on the third thing. Third thing is yeah, the right? natives, Beth McKigney and Troy Niedermeyer. As a marketing person, you need to listen to this because they go through why traditional ROAS all your legacy marketing metrics are not going to work as we start to get into more of what you're talking about, like how when people are using mm-hmm. things like Gen AI to enhance their shopping experiences. They talk about enterprise marketing return, which is a proprietary thing for them that helps finance marketing. All the teams get together on like what the right metrics should be. Super smart podcast. So make sure to check it out. And now we can get to the headlines. Thank yes, you. we can, and and we can, and and I want you to listen really closely before I get to the headlines because that sound. Did you hear that sound in the background? It's very faint, Dan. This I morning hear, it was. I hear geese hissing. My terrifying yeah, yeah. nightmare. 
Right, right. Yeah, you have geese outside your window, don't you? Yes. Yeah, and before when we tried to rep- record this before, there was a pool pump. But like, but that sound, Ed, that sound you hear, yes, is actually the sound of thousands and thousands of retail's best people clickety clacking, clickety clacking, clickety clacking on their keyboards during shop talk, shop talks meetup selections week. What's meetup selections week? All you listeners want to know. Well, if you have a ticket to shop talk, this is when your profile gets revealed to everyone else who's going. You get to pick who you want to meet with. And of course, even better, you get picked too. That's always the best part. Ever. You get picked. Well, you hopefully get you get best. picked, right? Yeah. No, just right? yeah. No, every, get, yeah. That's right. the benefit. You don't get, if you're in the meetup process, you get picked. So that's great. You're making me think of high school and Morp and like, you yes, and I didn't get picked for Morp. Um, well, we've been to re- every retail event there is, or at least we will have by the end of this year, I think. And so nothing, I mean, nothing is like meetup at shop talk. It doesn't exist anywhere else. There's simply no better way to connect with people who matter to your business. Meetup selections week is happening right now, but it does end on Friday, everyone. This is not a drill. So book your ticket today. Make sure your profile is visible and start making your own selections. Retailers and fans, don't forget, you can also use our code AmiTalk to save an extra 10% off current rates. Just Google shop talk to learn more. All right, today we've got news on Amazon adding new grocery delivery and pickup windows, Microsoft augmenting its AI portfolio, Schnooks debuting its smart cart from Instacart, and Mark Laurie's new food startup Wonder opening inside of a Walmart store. But we begin today with what is seemingly just absolutely huge news out of Macy's. That's right, Chris. Uh, Headline number one, Macy said yesterday that it plans to close 150 of its stores. According to CNBC, after sales fell another 2% in the most recent quarter and after releasing another tepid outlook on 2024, Macy's plans to close about 150 unproductive locations and will step up investments in the approximately 350 namesake locations that will remain open, with 50 of the 150 stores set to close this year. It plans to focus more on selling luxury goods by opening about 15 new Bloomingdale stores and at least 30 uh, new Blue Mercury stores over the next three years. It will also plan to remodel roughly 30 of the Blue Mercury stores during that time. The company is also pressing ahead with its strategy of opening smaller Macy stores and suburban strip malls. Last year, it announced it would open 30 of the new strip mall shops over the next two years. Those locations are roughly one fifth of the size of the traditional Macy's mall stores. And Chris, um, this is a big headline, first of all. Everybody's talking about this. Quite big, quite big. Everybody's talking about this at E-Tail. But also A&M wants to know what your thoughts are. They're going to put you on the spot right now in question number one. All right. They want to know, uh, Macy's CEO's comments are interesting despite the very rough year-over-year performance numbers. However, while Macy's says their customers want to shop more in digital channels and smaller format stores, given Macy's digital channel declines, do you think it is that customers want to shop less in brick-and-mortar locations or do they just want to shop less in Macy's brick and mortar location? Oh, the floor is yours. Oh, 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 wow. Shots fired in him. Oh, my yeah. God. Oh, my God. Oh, man. Ouch. Better them than me. Uh, wow. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I hate to say it, but it's definitely the latter part of that, that question. Like, that's what I think is going on here. I, I took agree. a lot of heat yesterday and um, on social media. I reposted an article I wrote back in January 10th. 2019 mm-hmm. saying that department stores and calling out Macy's in particular were dead. And I took a lot of heat for that because people were accusing me of taking a victory lap, but I wasn't, I was really saying it just to highlight the fact of, yeah, you might think these moves are bold and they might mm-hmm. be necessary, but I don't think they're enough. And I think our nostalgia is still getting the better of us as an industry. As we look at this, like, I don't think this is anything to applaud. I think what it shows me is what we've talked about a lot on the show, which I think it's time to split these apart. It's time mm-hmm. to die divest the assets, like do something different with Bloomingdale's, do something different with Blue Mercury, take it away from Macy's. It reminds me of, it reminds me of what, what, what Target went through back when it owned Marshall Fields and Mervyn's. Like, yeah, yes, they're all right. retailers, but like, what is the benefit of keeping them all together? I don't see what that is anymore. And I think yeah. that's what this announcement is emblematic of the most. And the small store thing, we've talked about that a ton too. Like, you know, why do I need a smaller department store? That's that's the whole point of a department store. It's a bigger selection of products. And like, yeah. then you start going and just becoming another specialty retailer. So like, why is that a road to anywhere as well? So 
I don't know. But what do you think? I mean, are you sharing the same sentiment that I am? Yeah, I mean, I think there's like there's a couple key points here. First, I think I like the move into luxury and I like the investment in yes. blue mercury. So I think you're spot on with saying like those are the areas to focus on. I worry a little bit that this could be like we're moving to smaller format. We're just going to put Bloomingdale's signs on reconfigured Macy stores. And that doesn't get at the core problem that you have as Macy's. And that's your merchandising. Like the store experience is so awful right now. Like it's a, it's just, it's not someplace that people want to go. It's not where they can accomplish things. Um, there's no inspiration happening there because the majority of the stores are just like digging through piles and piles of stuff. So I think, you know, we have to something drastic had to be done so i'm not surprised to hear that tony springs doing yeah. this i'm excited to hear him on stage at shop talk in a couple of weeks because hopefully we'll hear from his mouth directly Great like point. how things are going but yeah i think i think to really differentiate like you said like there's a lot that macy's is gonna have to do and i i just i i don't have any any like love lost if macy's just went away i don't know that the majority of the consumers in the market do either i don't know yeah, that's a great point too, because we've talked about this on the show a lot too. Every every change to a business model has a cost. And that's the part right. that's still not being talked about. Like they can flippantly say they want to put more service into the existing Macy's boxes, but that's going to cost you money. And so, yeah, maybe getting rid of the stores will save you money in the short term to help do that. But for the long term, that's still a big issue. And it's still a big, big issue you're going to have to pay for to upgrade the service level in those stores. So yeah, I don't, I just don't see how this works. All right, headline number two. Amazon has added advanced grocery pickup and delivery windows. According to Chain Store Age, Amazon is offering a new service that lets customers plan ahead when it comes to scheduling their weekly grocery pickup or delivery. The new service, known as, gotta love the alliteration here, and recurring reservations, is a nationwide offering that enables shoppers to plan ahead and set up their preferred day and time window for weekly grocery pickup and delivery up to seven days in advance. And here, Anne, because I know you were curious. Here is how the service I am works. Always curious, You're Chris. You know that. Waiting with bated breath, Anne, for me to tell you this. I know customers get their preferred pickup or delivery time automatically reserved each week. Reservation notifications are then set two days in advance and an hour before the reservation expires for customers to keep their preferred time. Shoppers can add items they may have forgotten at any point before the shopper begins picking their groceries. And payment occurs when customers are ready to check out and can be modified or canceled at any time with no obligation. So, and my question for you is this. Yeah. I kind of am, I'm kind of hedging my best that you weren't at all surprised to see this announcement. Am I correct in thinking that? Yes, you are 100% correct. It Why makes, is that? It makes Amazon money. Like number one, this is, <laughs> this is like, look, we need to, it, we need to try to train like, Amazon trained us as customers to expect things right. to be delivered same day, two right. hours, 30 point. minutes, yeah. right? Like we, Amazon's realizing, which they've done with all of the, like, now you have to pay 30, minimum $35 grocery order to get delivery if you're a prime member, like all these things, everybody's realizing like you can't afford to do this and it's finally caught up with Amazon. And so I think yep. number one, this is driving the experience. Like how can we do Amazon grocery and not, you know, cost us an arm and a leg. But number two, the thing that I love about this is that it proves to me that from a consumer standpoint, that convenience yes. is no longer synonymous with speed. It does not have to be delivered so quickly in all cases. And especially for your weekly recurring grocery order. Like I know I get the same things over and over again. So to me, it seems like this is something that the customer is just going to start to get used to. It's still convenient. It's on their schedule. They get to determine their time slot and Amazon gets to save money. But what, what are your thoughts? Are you with me on this one? Or I, I am a hundred percent with you. I thought, yeah. you, I thought you explained that wonderfully. And, but I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually put a little more hyperbole into it. And I, the funny thing is I don't think this is hyperbole at all. Like I actually think of all the headlines, this is one of the most important ones we've done so far this year. Because of what it means for the future of the grocery industry in total. Because like, if you strip it back, there's the, the business operations side and there's the customer side, which is both the points you hit on. From the business operations side, it's cheaper for Amazon to run this model because it's like, it's like load factoring on the airlines. You know when the trucks are going out, the idea is you try to fill them up, up as much as possible on a regular schedule cadence. 
Right. It's why when we heard what Buncha was doing with basically yep. doing the same process with their W2 drivers, we jumped at the chance to be a part of what they're doing. And we asked to be on their advisory board because we believe in the model. Yeah. So I think in the long run, what this is showing me, because Amazon's doing it now, it's validating Buncha's idea. Mm -hmm. And then also it's, it's not going to be long before we see scheduled weekly deliveries on every P product detail page of a grocery e-commerce experience as the cheaper option for the customers, yes. right? Because yes. customers will go where things are cheaper. And the other point that I'll make, they'll also go where the quality is better. Yes. So the thing that's great about this setup is Amazon's probably getting the benefit of this too. I know a bunch of does like you get the same driver going to the neighborhoods at the same time every day. So yep. the quality and the service level is better than say in the quick delivery scenario, when you're just farming it out to whatever white label gig delivery driver can do the order at that time. Yeah, and, and just kind of hope and pray that it works, right? Yes, grocery is a great, a great call out, Chris, but I don't think it's limited to grocery. Like, I think this is it's a big either. because That's I think that it's thing. going yes. to expand. Go like, there first. Buncha is yeah. great, yeah. And a great example, but like they're expanding outside of grocery too. And I think that right. this is going, it costs too much for these companies, regardless of industry, to do delivery on these timelines without getting some help and pull from the customer. And this, like you said, like what Bunch has been doing for a while, now what Amazon is doing, it's retraining the customer to just set the expectations. As long as you're transparent with when it can get there and you deliver on time, the customer is going to want that option if it's cheaper too. And we heard from Kim Bojan at Thematic too, and that demand shaping like this is already happening in Europe. Yeah. Right. So, the, and they're always ahead of us too. So yes, a hundred percent. All right. 100%. Let's move on to headline number three. Microsoft, Chris is partnering with Mistral AI to expand beyond open AI. According to Fast Company, Mistral AI emerged less than a year ago, but is already what Microsoft described Monday as a quote, innovator and trailblazer, end quote, at the vanguard of building more efficient and cost-effective AI systems. Microsoft and Mistral didn't disclose the financial terms of the deal, although Microsoft said it involves a small investment in the Paris-based startup. Mistral on Monday also released a public test version of its own chatbot, Chris, called Le Chat. Le Chat. Le Chat. Uh, that apparently was flooded <laughs> with so much interest that a company executive said it was temporarily unavailable for part of the day. Chris, are you ready to try Le Chat after your conversation with Sir Le Tab earlier at- uh, yes, Sir Le Tab, yeah. Uh, yeah, three words, and suck le bleu. That's how I'm feeling about this. Like, what does that even I mean? mean? Is that like, oh my goodness? Like, oh my gosh, yeah. Like, okay, oh goodness, okay. I, think. I don't know, okay. I don't, don't quote me on that. So I don't, I've never spoken French, obviously. But um, I mean, the funny thing about this story to me is like, it re it makes me think we're like kind of getting into the realm of the Betamax versus VHS of, yeah. of generative AI solutions here, or the or even the Google Yahoo battle. If, I mean, I remember there were geeks at Stanford that were like, you use Yahoo, what? what you, you have no idea what you're doing. Like, that's what I think we're going for here. But I mean, net, net, I think it's smart for Microsoft to do what they're doing. They're trying yeah. to bolster their, their the, the number of bullets they have in the chamber in this regard. Um, but to me, I, you know, going back to the outset of the show, like it's coming, right? Yeah. And who the winner is going to be or what the best solution is, is still up for grabs. And so that's why the one call I would make is there's still a lot of people, particularly these conferences that are poo-pooing generative AI and its applications. And I just think I'd be slow to do that. It is the performance enhancing drug of the white collar worker. It makes you so much more productive. It's having an impact. It's it's just still the very early innings. And so, yeah, for that reason, Anne, I can't wait to try out the chat. Well, Chris, it goes back to what you said at the beginning of the of this podcast. Like, it's still in the early stages. It's still like, here's how we're using it. Here's how we're not. I think it's hard yeah. to dismiss it altogether. Like, it, it does, it's new. It's going to involve a lot of trial and error. Look at how much trial and error was involved when the internet first came about and you first started doing e-commerce sites. So I think for our listeners, like this brand came out of the woodwork for me and for us this week, number one, you have Microsoft investing in this company and partnering with this company. Amazon announced the same day that they're partnering yeah, with day. this company too. So you have to pay attention to this. And I think that the the last point I'll make is something that we talked about with the founder of Firework, Vincent Yang, yesterday at Etail. He's talking about like their biggest 
their biggest launch uh, as of late is this idea of one-to-one -one commerce. He used the example of like going to a brand's website and having a Zoom meeting. I think that I don't, I haven't used the chat yet and I haven't used Mistral's tools, but I'm guessing by the investment that we're seeing Amazon and Microsoft make in partnering with this company, that it could involve some kind of unlock like that, where you're starting to have real feeling, live feeling chats through something like generative AI or AI to really gain confidence in a purchase that you're about to make online that you've never been able to do online before. So I think mm -hmm. this is an area where you really have to pay attention, follow this closely, try it out. We want to hear what you think if you try it out next week too, but I, I don't think it's something that people can sweep under the rug or try, try once and then say, we did it and it doesn't work. Yeah. I so well said, like to me, the number one aha that I've had coming out of this show is that the idea of conversational commerce by way of AI is real. Like yes. the decades of the nineties were all about the speed and convenience of e-commerce as a delivery mechanism, right? Yes. yes. The next wave of digital is going to be about how the tactile and confidence that we need when we shop is going to be augmented online in new ways never done before. That's going to be the next realm of digital experience because that's always what physical source had against digital. Yeah. But generative AI gives you the capability to ameliorate that benefit over a physical retail experience. And that conversational commerce angle is what it's going to be a hundred percent all about. I can't wait for it. It's so exciting to me. Like, yes. I love just being, don't you too? I mean, yes. Yeah. I mean, talking we're, about it, but we're at the beginning of like an entirely new, I mean, I felt that way since AI came about, you know, a yeah. year ago, two yeah, years ago. You me, you're like, oh my God, have you seen this? Like, this is crazy. Yeah. It was we'll bus, remember but... that forever, probably. Yeah, we will. Yeah, we will. I will. You're right. hundred percent. I will remember the day where I was when you talked to me that. So, all right, let's keep rolling. Headline four. Great show today. I love this. Schnucks has officially debuted its AI powered shopping carts from Instacart in St. Louis. According to NBC5 out of St. Louis, the pilot program finally launched last week at the Schnucks Twin Oaks location, which is located at 1393 Big Ben Road for all you St. Louis listeners out there that want to go and check it out. In the upcoming weeks, also two additional stores will join the pilot program. Now, Anne, this could be a coincidence, but I don't think it, I don't think it is. No. Amazon, Amazon also yesterday announced that it is testing 15 of its smart shopping carts that allow customers to skip the checkout lines at its San Mateo, California Whole Foods store, according to a Mercury News report. So, Anne, my question to you. What are your latest thoughts on the smart card? Or do you think the jury is still out for you? Like, where, where's your head right now? Okay, Schnooks is doing it. So I have to pay attention to it. I cannot be closed minded. Right. right. It's another tool, another car they can put on the, the smart store super highway that is Schnooks grocery <laughs> store right now. But to me, and I might be off on this. I can't wait to hear what you think. But to me, it reminds me of like Zach Morris's cell phone in Saved by the Bell. <laughs> like, I still it's feel a like phone. <laughs> it's like, I just feel like we're still too early in the smart cart phase that this is going to be the version that we'll eventually see at grocery stores all over the country in the world. Like, it still feels clunky to me. It still feels like expensive and bulky and like i get that there's the retail media angle like i see i understand the benefits of it but i just don't think that like this output is the one that we're going to start to see go crazy and really change lives and i still don't like that it doesn't have a an area for to put a kid in um and or like what happens when you i don't know i i'm going to go down that tinfoil hat path if i keep talking but Long story short, <laughs> I, I think we still have a ways to go. And I'll, I I'll, will be in close contact with Dave Steck to hear how things are really going. Apparently customers are loving them already, but I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, from the, from the stories here from Amazon and how they talk about it, that seems to be the case for sure. So, um, but uh, I don't know, for me, and like, yeah, I think the, the jury saw it's a good analogy because I think that the, the foreman is still keeping us in and we're still deliberating. You know, that's how I, that, that's kind of how I've got the image in my head there. But I don't, the fact that Schnucks is doing it is definitely validating. I, I mean, the saving grace for me is the retail media play. Like you get the attribution with this. So yeah. like, yeah, if you've got five carts in your store or even 15, like, like Amazon's doing a Whole Foods, like that's not a discernibly different amount of carts. So you're not right. getting probably that many trials in this, but yeah. 
from the retail media play, like you get your most tech affluent customers to use it on the margins. You're probably going to learn and you can get some benefits there. Um, probably drive some incremental purchases at the same time, learn a ton. So for that reason, I like it, but yeah, you know, it does still feel like, I mean, if we're at the early innings of generative AI, like what inning, are we, uh, I don't even think we're out of warm ups on smart cards, you know, no. and, and, and like, you know, is it even a sport that ends up taking off? I don't know to mix my metaphors here. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, they're, they're trying it out. They'll see what works, what doesn't, what needs to be improved before they roll them out. It's still, like you said, still the early stages. So good luck to you, smart carters. Um, all yeah. right, Chris, let's go to headline number five. Mark Lorre's food startup is opening inside of a Walmart. That is right. According to Chain Storage, food startup Wonder said it's opening its 11th location, which is both its first in Pennsylvania and its first inside a Walmart store or any big box retailer for that matter at Walmart's Quakertown, Pennsylvania store on February 21st, just last week. So in January 2023, it should be noted, Wonder abandoned its previous mobile food truck focus and pivoted to an operating strategy reminiscent of the ghost kitchen model, which operated 10 kitchens in and around New Jersey and New York uh, that offer delivery and in-location dining and pickup. Wonder's newest location will offer food from eight restaurants that are owned and operated by Wonder, including Lime Salt, Yasa's, Alonza Pizza, Tejas, Wing Trip, Burger Baby, Fred's Meat and Bread, and Room for Dessert. Delivery radius will include five area zip codes, and everything is made to order at the Wonder storefront and delivered to customers by Wonder's own couriers in less than 30 minutes. Chris, um, you and Mr. Laurie have like a, a back and forth hot checkered past on again, off again relationship. Where do you come down on Wonder going inside of Walmart? Oh God, you know, yeah. Before I answer that, I do want to go back to the Schnooks smart card thing for a second because I think it was important. I was kind of remiss. I think both of us were not to point out the fact that it is kind of a momentous thing that Schnooks is now piloting this too, right? Yeah. Like, like, and Instacart is doing it too. Like, Instacart has gone into a real live grocer now, so that is a that is a big deal. That I that's and that's why we highlighted that story. But back to the Mark Lori thing, yeah. I mean. I'm split on this one, Ann. I'm split okay. on this. I'm kind of it's kind of like my past with him. Like, I like this as an idea. I okay. like it as a concept because, and you and I have a lot of experience on this too, believe it or not, folks. But like, I think there is a space for the mass market super center to recreate the food court experience mm -hmm. and to do so in a way that takes a page out of the ghost kitchen model, adds delivery to it, but makes it a place to go and eat and gives you a lot of variety in your food. And it looks like they have basically every ethnic food group covered, all at least the major ones too, in terms of that list that you read. So, so for that reason, I like it because I think it, I think there's a lot of ground to be picked up there from all the malls that have, you know, just gone away over the years. But the thing that I don't like about it is all the hokum, and I don't think it's worth $200 million of his own money to invest in it. He's got one store with Walmart, which we've talked about. Like when you put your store in with the people you used to do business with, that's not as validating as when you put it in somewhere else and somewhere new. So, and you know, Pitbull's got his own store, as we're going to find out in a little bit too, with Walmart. So like, so like I'm tempering that. And the whole idea of like the food super app as well, that's just bunk. So this is not a technological idea. I actually kind of think it's beneath Mark Lori. I think it's a good business idea, mm -hmm. but it's not a technologically advanced idea as he's trying to spin it to be. Sure. So that's my thing. Sure. But what sure. do you think? Yeah, do you I mean, like this? I think I think it's a great business decision. I mean, with 90% of Americans living within 10 miles of a Walmart, yeah. like as far as operations are concerned, it's, it's the same reason that, you know, malls are in the places that they are. Like you are, have the access to the highest amount of rooftops in great an point. area all over the country. So if this were to scale and he can use his relationship with Walmart as a way to scale Great this partner. and use the kitchen, that's super smart. Um, I think it's potentially going to bring a new audience to Walmart. Like if you are going, like it does give you maybe a reason to go into a Walmart to get access to these things, to, you know, pick up your groceries, pick up your food, pick up your dinner. Like, yeah, it's great. The, the whole like food court inside of a super center idea that you're talking about. I have a couple of things that I'll, I'm I'm curious to see how this happens. Like Ooh. one one I want to know if there's going to be any integration and if they can do that within this pilot with Walmart Plus delivery because I think that's where the oh, real yeah. crux of the success of this could be is if you can get 
the delivery of your food, plus your essentials, plus your apparel, plus your groceries, all in one delivery, like what we saw Kroger trying to do a couple of years ago when they opened their Cincinnati store. That to me, that is gold. And that is a model that you can scale across yeah. the entire country. I like that. We haven't heard much about that. The second and Amazon thing, can't do that either, and sorry, but Amazon right. can't do that either. So, like, that's yeah, a good point. especially if you subsidize it with part of the plus benefits or something. Right. Or, your only your only competitor yeah. there is really DoorDash, who's doing that now with you know the double dashes and stuff that you can do mm-hmm. from grocery, Sephora, Dix, whatever. Um, but then, Chris, I have a question. Like, what what is what keeps you from shopping in a Walmart? Like, is there something that keeps you from going there for your day-to-day goods right now? Like outside of location for us, it's probably like, it's not convenient for us. No, I mean, like, no, when I go to California, I shop at Walmart all the time. So it's yeah. just, there's, there's nothing that really keeps me from doing it. I, I think it's a great, great experience, generally speaking. So for me yeah. in Minnesota, it's just more location and there's targets everywhere, you know? So that's, that's what it is. But why, what do you ask? Well, I guess for? my, so my question is around like, Okay, if an experience if, like this would actually help considerably too, totally. draw me in more. 100%. Yes, exactly. So that's where I'm going with this too. Is like, could this be a reason for people to try Walmart when they haven't already gone to Walmart if they have a, a multiple or a multitude of options? I guess the thing for me though is like, what what else are we going to see from a store investment from Walmart to to like surround that experience more? Will we start to see investment in these types of concepts or almost like going more in the target direction of Walmart where like they're really focused on making the store experience more enticing, more shoppable to uh, to complement this if it does roll out in the future? Because I think that's still for me like something that's just missing about about the overall Walmart experience. Yeah, right. And yeah, I mean, the, the proof will be in the pudding of how you execute this, right? So yeah. that's why, yeah, I mean, it's it's cool. This You're right. It's a great partner for him, for Lori, you yeah. know, for the reasons you're saying. But the, the real proof will be in the pudding of, you know, when is the next one and how many of the next ones are there as well, right? right? So right. that'll be interesting to see. But I mean, you and I are both. I mean, we have experience thinking about this concept mm-hmm. together. Right. And, and um, you know, we, we think there's a there there is the best yes. way to put it. Yes, absolutely. All right, Chris, let's get to the lightning round. Question number one, Tyla, the pop star, is in a new Gap commercial that is being considered this generation's khaki swing campaign, which I know you love very much. Uh, Which move would you make in this situation? Would you rerun the 90s khaki swing campaign as is or would you go this route the richard dixon route of bringing in yet another celebrity to try to get people to go in and shop the gap which which path are you taking yeah i I personally i watched the commercial and maybe i'm not the target audience anymore but it didn't do much for me the tyler commercial so no brian i think i'm going i no, i think i'm going all in i think i'm going all in on nostalgia and yeah no you said brian sensor that's what i was gonna say i'm going all in on brian sensor i'm going all in on big bad voodoo daddy like let's just go all in on that get them back and just blow it out. Cause I, I don't know what, well, you know, what the heck else is going to work, but all right. And KFC's new Chiza, C-H-I-Z-Z-A features Ooh. two extra crispy fillets topped with marinara sauce, mozzarella cheese, and pepperoni. How long before you and your brood order up a Chiza? Soon. I mean, I would try it. Really? I think it sounds good. Yeah. I mean, really? you have like, buffalo chicken pizza which is basically sure. this same thing just with out the buffalo sauce so yeah i would try would you yeah we had a, well yeah we had a chicken parmesan pizza at that famous place oh, in New York. Yeah. I, can't remember, I can't remember the name of it for the life of me but yeah it was decent i saw yeah. you other doing it 100%. yeah yeah okay all right um chris pitbull is opening a miami grill themed restaurant inside of the walmart in las vegas as you alluded to earlier if you could choose one celebrity and a food concept for your local walmart store what would it be oh man uh God, for me, I think I'm going to go back to the well on this. I'm going to say Minka Kelly can open a restaurant oh, and, and she could call it dinner for two. And there would be a table, just one table inside the thousand square foot restaurant. And it would just have placards for Minka and Chris right next to it. That's what it oh, would be. Oh my take. God. That not a model that will scale, <laughs> not, not going to produce a lot of revenue with only <laughs> one customer for that one. No, no. <laughs> Business model validation is not important to the answer no. to that question Clearly. at all. Yet. Clearly. Well, okay. <laughs> all right. A human finger was recently found in a Walmart parking lot in Ohio. And police are asking for help. 
in trying to figure out how it got there. And which of the five fingers would you least want to see in the parking lot of a Walmart? A pinky, a thumb, an index finger? Which one, Ed? Honest, I, be honest with you. I hope that's not part of Mark Laurie's new food concept is involving <laughs> oh pinkies. Um, okay, I, ooh, what's the worst one? Any finger with nail polish on it. Like, I just think oh, like- gross! That, that humanizes it too that. much. Like- a toe, a finger, like I think if it was just like a finger of like a normal dude, that'd be fine. But like if there was like nail art on the nail, that's where I draw the line and I'm almost vomiting. Like a Lee press on nail or something? Yes. Yeah. Like yes. oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. All I can think about is I'd hate to be the the crime scene Ugh. guy that had to index index that crime scene. All right, happy birthday today to John Totoro, Bernadette Peters, and to Lance Harbors. Squeeze and Varsity Blues, the wonderful Ali Larder. And remember, if you can only read or listen to one retail media podcast in the business, make it Omni Talk, the only retail media outlet run by two former executives from a current top 10 U.S. retailer. Our Fast Five podcast is the quickest, fastest rundown of all the week's top news. And our daily newsletter, The Retail Daily Minute, tells you all you need to know each day to stay on top of your game as a retail executive and also regularly features special content that is exclusive to us and the Ann and I take a heck of a lot of pride in doing just for you. Thanks as always for listening in. Please remember to like and leave us a review wherever you happen to listen to your podcast or on YouTube. You can follow us today by simply going to youtube.com slash Omnitalk Retail. So until next week, Ann, I think we're back in Minnesota, back back home side, right? Next week? Finally, yes, we're back. For a, for a hot second, and then we head back out to Vegas. So Back out to Vegas for NGA, the National Grocers Association show. We just signed on to do that show as well. So on behalf of all of us at Army Talk Retail, until next week, as always, be careful out there. The Army Talk Fast Five is brought to you in association with the A&M Consumer and Retail Group. The A&M Consumer and Retail Group is a management consulting firm that tackles the most complex challenges and advances its clients, people, and communities toward their maximum potential. CRG brings the experience, tools, and operator-like pragmatism to help retailers and consumer products companies be on the right side of disruption. And Avalara. Avalara makes tax compliance faster, easier, more accurate, and more reliable for 30,000 plus business and government customers in over 90 countries. Avalara leverages 1,200 plus signed partner integrations to power tax calculations, document management, tax return filing, and tax content access. Visit avalara.com to improve your compliance journey. And Williot, Williot's ambient IoT visibility platform powered by battery-free Bluetooth tags, eliminate scanning for real-time end-to-end inventory visibility. For more information, head to williot.com slash Omnitalk and TGW. Revolutionize your grocery supply chain with TGW. Their experts tailor automation solutions to your needs, ensuring you have the edge. Work with TGW before your competition does. Discover more at tgw-group.com and Sezzle. Sezzle is an innovative buy now, pay later solution that allows shoppers to split purchases into four interest-free payments over six weeks. To learn more, visit Sezzle.com.